Okay, so welcome to the Virtual Brain in Clinical Research Online Summer School. I'm very glad to see that we have many participants. I, I think we are now 58. And I think this is the big benefit of having the summer school online so everyone uh, from everywhere is able to join. There are no costs, uh, there are, are no, there's no air pollution for travel, and everyone really um, can participate. So let me just give you a little bit of background information about the group that is uh, organizing the summer school. We are the brain simulation section located at the Charité and the Berlin Institute of Health. Here you see the Charité uh, University Hospital main building at the campus Charité Mitte. And uh, we are located, our lab is located directly behind um, the Charité Hospital building and the little building with a green roof with grass on top. So in the course of, of the, the summer school, you will also meet several of our lab members who will give presentations and the subsequent uh, sessions. Um, most of you probably know what the virtual brain is all about. The virtual brain enables for personalized brain simulation. So it's possible to construct individualized uh, computational brain models on the computer, either from a human uh, person, like here, for example, you see our lab member, Jessica Palmer, and her um, computational brain. Or this is also possible, of course, um, with animal brains, for example, macaques, monkey brains, and rodent brains. So what is the, the um, challenge that we want to address and solve with this uh, approach? Um, as you also all uh, are aware of, the brain is complex. And in order to really understand brain function, it is uh, necessary to be able to connect many different observations that happen at many different scales, spatial and temporal scales. Here you see some examples. Typically, methods in neuroscience uh, spend a certain scale, so a certain temporal range or spatial range, but none of the methods really is capable to measure all the processes at all the scales at the same time. So the challenge is to make sense of the different observations and to link them together in a self-consistent theoretical framework. And this is what the virtual brain tries uh, to provide. So typically, um, in order to construct an individualized brain model, we have different ingredients, measurements. Um, here you see the most typical ones, but later on you will see that we also can integrate other types of measurements. Here you see, for example, a structural connectome. You see it here also on the right side. You see the geometry of the cortical surface. Here you see now a colorful parcellation. You see then the neural mass models uh, that are sitting in each of the regions of the brain and that are communicating and interacting through the reconstructed structural connectome. And this was a human brain, obviously. Here you see a Markic brain, so it's um, uh, with the same methods. Also for the Markic, we can do diffusion tensor imaging and reconstruct the tractogram and then construct individualized monkey brains. So after such a structural model has been uh, generated, it is possible to simulate the model and to generate activities. And this could be local field potentials, firing rates um, of neuronal populations, EG, MEG, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and other activity measures. The software has been released for the first time in 2012. And here you see the, um, the portal. So if you start uh, the software, this will be the entry page uh, that you find. Here you see the lead institutions, um, Marseille University, Baycrest. Uh, this is a hospital uh, connected to the University of Toronto in Canada and the Charité Hospital. 
And one year after the first release of this open source framework, we brought out this publication that describes how the virtual brain can be used to integrate different types of uh, imaging data with computational neuroscience. So for the first time, it was possible to use computational uh, neuroscience methods in combination with individual measurements for personalized uh, prediction. And you find the software under the URL, the virtualbrain.org. There you can also download it. There are other places where it can be downloaded. Here we have a counter. So in the past uh, 10 years now, in the release, the first release was in 2012, we had more than 40,000 downloads. And I think I didn't take the screenshot today, but I think last week, but uh, this is quite a good uh, and common average that we have now 500 to sometimes 700 uh, downloads of the software in 30 days. And the present version of the virtual brain is uh, 2.41. Um, it can be deployed on different platforms, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And you always find also the latest publications that have been generated with the software on this website. You also find many didactic tutorials, the so-called virtual brain edupack, and also announcements um, of events, courses like this one, and other important information related to the virtual brain. There's also a Google group, so if you have questions, you can directly ask your questions via the Google group. Um, some of you I have seen participated in the so-called call school in the previous online course that we gave a couple of months ago. And uh, for those, I have good news. Uh, so we will have a um, repetition of content, um, of course, but we also in this course will focus on the latest developments. Uh, so the, the latest innovations that have been made with the virtual brain uh, software, the latest additions. And uh, today, when I give you an overview talk, uh, also in order to inspire you with, with these uh, novel developments, I will um, tell you about the multi-scale co-simulations that we have developed over the past two years and that now have been applied for the first time for uh, clinical research, specifically for in silico deep brain stimulation research. Then I will show you an example of how one can use the virtual brain for digital drug testing. I will um, show you in more detail the in silico deep brain stimulation work that we have uh, developed in our lab. Um, also very new and important development is uh, a method to integrate systematically biological knowledge from the literature, also from digital atlases in our uh, brain network models to increase the biological realism or also to adapt our brain network models to known changes that occur, for example, in aging or in brain disease or during development. Um, I will show you quickly um, also a new development where we connected the virtual brain with a robotics uh, simulation platform to not only simulate brain dynamics, but also the motor outputs that can be generated by the dynamics. And finally, I will show you very uh, exciting recent work uh, where we not use the virtual brain just for simulating dynamics, but really for understanding the cognitive processes and the cognitive uh, function and performance of individual humans. So let me just explain at the beginning how we construct uh, brain network models. In 2015, we have published the first uh, pipeline that helps to generate personalized uh, brain models from imaging data. So here you see, for example, the reconstruction of the tractogram, the detailed fiber tracts that connect different brain regions. Here you see the parcellation. And by the way, this is now just Jessica's brain. So this is an individualized brain, not an average brain. Um, here you see now the abstraction of the tractogram, the structural connectivity, with different connection strengths between the different brain regions. Then each center of an, a brain region 
we have a neural mass model and they're interacting through this structural connectome. And here you see a first hint towards the multi-scale co-simulation. So what we developed in the past two years is a possibility to run the virtual brain that simulates brain regions at the level of neural mass models or mean field approximations of neuronal population activity. And we combine this with um, more detailed uh, simulation frameworks that simulate uh, neuronal activity on the level of individual cells and networks of spiking neurons. And here you see that some of the regions um, have been substituted by spiking uh, neural networks. And we can now study the interaction of the global coarse brain dynamics with uh, the more detailed um, dynamics of uh, spiking neural networks. So with the help of these pipelines uh, that are fully digital and uh, automated, it is possible to process larger cohorts of uh, imaging data sets. On this initial publication, we have processed uh, 49 uh, virtual brains and um, also validated the accuracy and the precision of, of the pipeline. And uh, uh, in the past uh, now seven years, we have uh, further developed the pipeline. It's now available as containerized uh, so-called Docker image and that can be executed on any system, it can be run on a supercomputer, it can be run on your local notebook and enables for processing large um, cohorts of uh, multimodal imaging data sets. So for example, the several thousands of brains that are, or brain imaging uh, brain data sets that are available um, from the UK Biobank. Um, one big advantage or benefit that brain network modeling provides to us is the possibility to use the model as a computational microscope. And this is illustrated here. This is work that has been published a couple of years ago um, in eLife, where we have simulated uh, the brains of, I think, 15 um, adult human subjects. We simulated 15 minutes of resting state fMRI activity. Here you see just an example. And by reproducing this resting state fMRI activity, we are now able, with the help of the model, to reconstruct the underlying neuronal interactions. So for example, the um, relationship between local excitatory and inhibitory firing, as you can see here. So here for the illustration, we picked one occipital region and we see now um, the precise time course of the excitation firing and inhibition firing of this population. We have this information in each individual region of the brain. And uh, typically, population firing rates can only be measured invasively by inserting electrodes in the brain. And this is possible in some patients where this is done, for example, in epilepsy patients or during neurosurgery. But even there, um, the information is very sparse because only very few electrodes with very few sensors can be inserted in the brain. So you will never have really a dense recording of uh, population firing rates or local field potentials from every part of the brain. So here you see now already some more features that are captured by the model. So what we see here is the EG source activity. So in this uh, little um, cohort, we had simultaneous EG and functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, data that we had recorded in our lab. And we now constructed these brain network models and um, optimized the models such that they captured the resting state activity uh, measured with fMRI uh, in each individual subject. And now the optimized model, models could be injected with artificial signals. And this is what you see here. Here, for example, we have an artificial 10 hertz oscillation, the so-called alpha rhythm that can be seen in healthy human subjects. It's the dominant frequency that you find in the EG. And here you see the envelope now, uh, the power um, fluctuations of this 10 hertz oscillation. 
this can be injected in such a personalized brain and we then can probe how such an injection um, changes the um, excitatory firing, inhibitory firing, but also the postsynaptic inhibitory currents, excitatory currents, and of course, then also the forward model signals like the EGMEG, or as you can see here, the fMRI. And this is, we can see how, for example, an alpha rhythm um, relates via what kind of complex mechanisms to the slow um, resting state fluctuations that we can observe in functional magnetic resonance imaging. And this is also illustrated here in the top panel where we see as a result of the simulations, the inverse correlations between the EG alpha rhythm and the simulated fMRI signal that we can also see in real data. But now with the model, we have um, all the processes, the underlying interactions that we can analyze to understand um, what uh, generates the observed relationship. So with the help of the virtual brain, we really understand how different observations are mechanistically linked together. Um, and here in this panel, which looks a little bit crowded, you just see even more features or state variables that we have encapsulated in our uh, brain network model that we now can mutually relate uh, so, for example, here in panel A, we see the firing rate of neurons and the phase of a single alpha oscillation. And uh, in our model, so in the upper panel, you see the model outputs, and in the lower panel, you see corresponding empirical data coming from different species, monkey, rat, monkey. Then for, for the EG and fMRI measures, we have human data. Um, and we can now relate these relationships from our model that are emerging um, from our model to the uh, frequently reported observations uh, from the empirical world. And here we found very nice correspondence, uh, for example, at the scale of only 100 milliseconds of a single alpha or 10 hertz oscillation between the phase of such an oscillation and the firing rate uh, with the data from the monkey. Or here in the second panel B, we look at the simulated excitation inhibition balance. So here you see the simulated inhibitory postsynaptic currents and excitatory postsynaptic currents and the local field potential activity. And that can be related to what one can measure in rats and what has been already published, uh, for example, in this uh, study, where we find a certain amplitude relationship between the inhibitory postsynaptic currents and excitatory postsynaptic currents that has been reproduced uh, and encapsulated in our human brain network model. And then in panel C, you see the relation of the firing rate and the alpha uh, power in our model and the same relation in the monkey. Also here, you see the same inverse relation, so that has been reproduced uh, by the model. And all these features actually were not, um, not implemented in the model uh, intentionally, but they were emerging after the model had been optimized to reproduce the functional magnetic resonance imaging resting state activity. Here in panel D, you see the inverse relation of the alpha EG power and the fMRI gold signal. Same has been published many, many times, including by our group um, for empirical data. We find scale-free um, behavior and simulated resting state fMRI, as has been reported for empirical fMRI. And we find the typical functional connectivity patterns and also switching of the functional connectivity, the continuous synchronization and desynchronization of subnetworks of the brain and our sim simulated data, as has been reported and also measured by our team before. So um, the, the virtual brain or brain network modeling in general enables to um, encapsulate um, different observations and to understand the principles that generate in these observations. And this is an example that will be also detailed later on by one of the colleagues of the lab, Dominic Koller, where we now look, uh, for example, at the principles of how traveling waves are being generated um, in the brain. 
So here on the left side, you see experimental data, intracranial recordings of traveling waves. And uh, what does traveling wave mean? It means uh, we have a, a frequency, for example, an alpha rhythm, and um, there's a wave front yeah, that travels systematically um, over the cortex. And uh, why is that important? Because uh, um, there's empirical evidence that the possibility to synchronize different distant parts of the brain via such traveling wave fronts enables for certain uh, cognitive functionalities of the brain, including potentially for binding together and fostering plasticity and memory consolidation and uh, distant parts of the brain. This is just the preliminary simulation that has been generated by Dominic, and I think he will give probably the, the, the last uh, lecture of uh, this uh, series. Um, so when we construct the brain network model, um, typically if we start a simulation, it does not um, generate uh, biologically plausible dynamics at the very beginning. So we need to decide which parameters of the model are set free and will be tuned and optimized such that um, empirical observations uh, can be reproduced. And so this is one example where we only have one free uh, parameter, the global scaling factor that rescales the degree of coupling between all the regions of the brain. So it's called uh, typically variable G. And here we change it systematically. And uh, the green and red and blue plot indicate the degree of correspondence between the simulated uh, feature and the empirical feature. So here we have, for example, the empirical functional connectivity that shows the degree of uh, correlation between the time series of different brain regions. Here the axis uh, are spent by, in this case, uh, about seven brain regions, and the color indi indicates a degree of correlation. And here we find uh, the simulated functional connectivity. And below we find the switching of the functional connectivity over time. Yeah? So it's a windowed approach. And with this you can uh, compute the functional connectivity dynamics matrix, where the, um, the, the blobs or, um, uh, with the same color indicate um, time periods when the functional connectivity stays uh, constant. So a certain network is synchronized uh, over a certain period of time and then it desynchronizes again. And uh, interestingly, so here in the middle you see features of the EG, I do not explain in detail, but uh, interestingly you see that for these three um, uh, selected features, functional connectivity, average functional connectivity over many minutes, the functional connectivity dynamics, so the involvement of synchronization and desynchronization over time, and also some EEG related features. Um, we selected here bistable behavior of the dominant uh, 10 hertz algorithm. They all emerge in a certain window uh, or a certain range of values of, of G, of the global scale and coupling. And, Beautifully uh, and uh, luckily, they all emerge in the same range. Yeah? So there's a certain range or sweet spot in the model where the biologically plausible behavior uh, occurs. And so the sweet spot is what we are looking for when tuning the model parameters. Um, since uh, the brain network modeling approach allows personalization and individualization, it is a very convenient approach for developing clinical research and potentially also clinical applications in the future. There are many lines of research ongoing, uh, for example, in the field of epilepsy, led by our French partners. And there we have a clinical trial ongoing at the moment, where um, several hospitals in France are investigating whether taking the predictions of the virtual brain into account in the decision-making uh, before the a, a neurosurgical intervention in these uh, patients with epilepsy um, benefits the patients or the outcome for the patients or not. 
So the study includes 400 patients and 200 are uh, operated according to the traditional approach. And the other 200 um, are operated, taken into consideration the detailed predictions about the, the, the site of epileptic activity and the spreading um, pathways of this pathological activity. Um, and I think we are now um, past the second year of this trial. So we have about two more years to know whether the virtual brain will be um, a potential application in, in clinical routine in the future. Another line of research relates to brain tumors, where the brain has been the, the virtual brain has been used to differentiate between um, tissue um, related to the brain tumor or tumor-free tissue. Um, then uh, new developments also employ brain network modeling for questions related to uh, psychiatric diseases and also the genetic variants underlying uh, the different psych psychiatric uh, diseases. Then we have uh, research ongoing, uh, started by our colleagues in Irvine, who now move to Dallas and Texas on predicting the outcome of stroke. So here you see a stroke virtual brain. And uh, this initial work by these colleagues indicated that using the uh, optimized uh, uh, parameters of the individual stroke models can predict the outcome uh, of the stroke, the functional outcome for the patients after the rehabilitation period. And in our team, we are now also working in collaboration with Hamburg um, uh, University Hospital, from which from whom we got uh, also stroke patient data um, to validate uh, these findings and um, further increase the accuracy of these predictions. And this is done. This is work done by Patrick Bay, who also will be presenting in one of the coming sessions. Then we are doing. Uh, research in the field of dementia, and also our Toronto colleagues have, have actually um, started this line of research. This is now a big uh, focus on our team. We are heading in the Virtual Brain Cloud project, which is a European Open Science Cloud project that um, has uh, in the focus the development of a cloud infrastructure for sensitive data to enable complex simulations um, of uh, dementia uh, virtual brains to identify early predictors and also mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases and in particular of Alzheimer's disease. And last but not least, also um, a line of research uh, led by our Canadian partners is, uh, is uh, the investigation of changes uh, of, uh, in traumatic brain injury. And I think there are several more, but these are the most prominent uh, examples. Uh, I, I think that probably I forgot some additional developments that are ongoing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, how we um, include even other data modalities than what I have mentioned. So um, MRI is the most central one, EEG, MEG, but here in this work related to uh, research uh, in the field of neurodegeneration, we included PET data for the first time. So what we see here is a PET scan uh, providing us with information about the um, concentration of beta amyloid uh, in the brain. And it has been shown previously in uh, the literature that in the vicinity of this beta amyloid that is actually a marker for Alzheimer's disease, the function of inhibitory interneurons is uh, impaired. Um, and this leads to um, uh, disinhibition of excitatory neurons, to hyperexcitation, excitotoxicity, and potentially also to cell death. And this relationship can be now included in our brain network models. We have now the distribution of the beta amyloid from each individual subject. Um, uh, provided by the PET data. And in this case, we used um, uh, data from the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. So we have data of Alzheimer's disease patients, of healthy controls, and patients with mild cognitive impairment. 
And all of them have uh, these PET scans. So for each individual, we have the distribution of the beta amyloid um, available. And uh, now we have um, uh, generated such a transfer function that couples the, bur couples the burden of the beta amyloid to the uh, functionality or the, the, the function of the inhibitory interneurons. And then just including in our brain network models this additional information, we find that uh, for healthy controls, after including this uh, beta amyloid, we still have in our simulations the prominent uh, alpha rhythm with the 10 hertz oscillations. But when including the beta amyloid burden for Alzheimer's disease patients, we see in our simulations a massive slowing of uh, the EEG. And we see a dominant frequency and the setter uh, band range, so uh, the oscillations around 4 hertz. And this is also what you see here. You see a peak for the Alzheimer's disease patient uh, at the setter band, uh, indicating the slowing of the EEG in our simulations. And exactly such a slowing is also observed in real patients with Alzheimer's disease. So with this model, we are now able to link together the observation that we find in PET, the accumulation, regionally different um, accumulation of beta amyloid, with the observation of a slowing of the EG in such patients. And this increases our mechanistic understanding, which also is helpful for identifying potential um, target points for therapeutic interventions or even uh, prevention of the development of a disease. Um, so this is a, um, a diagram that shows the state space that is spent by the excitatory pyramidal cells and the inhibitory neurons of one neural mass model, or one population, one brain region, independence of the, activ <coughs> sorry, the activity that comes from the surrounding brain network. And we see that uh, the dynamic repertoire of uh, the activity of the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons um, clearly depends on the degree of network input that neuronal population is receiving. So for example, here we see um, such a blue circle that indicates that uh, the membrane potentials of the pyramidal cells and inhibitor interneurons are circulating, yeah? they are oscillating. And here we see also such a spindle that indicates that um, there's a, also an oscillation with another frequency. And the arrows or flow fields indicate when we start the system at a certain point in the state space, where the state would move. So here it would be uh, a so-called limit cycle. Also here we have a limit cycle. And here we see that it moves to a so-called fixed point, to a single point um, on which then the system uh, remains. And such a state space analysis um, enables us to identify critical points. So where do we see, if we change the input, for example, um, uh, qualitative changes of the dynamic repertoire of, of these populations, neuronal populations. But uh, it also allows us to now systematically investigate if we change the coupling between the inhibitory interneurons and the pyramidal cells as a, um, as a consequence of the beta amyloid burden, how would that change the dynamics? And this is what we did here. So J is the control parameter that uh, represents the coupling between the inhibitory interneurons and the pyramidal cells. And we change that now stepwise. And we see how with each step, the uh, geometry um, of uh, the state space is changing, you know, the, the shape of the limit cycles, the location of the critical points, the presence or not presence of fixed points is changing with every step. And you see here these example trajectories that then are translated into time series, the local field potentials that then with the forwards model also can be translated in EG signals. And this shows you how um, the state space uh, then uh, maps 
do the actual time series that empirical, empirically working people are pretty familiar with, so the local field potential traces with the oscillations. And we can see now how the changing of the coupling between inhibitor interneurons and excitatory pyramidal cells leads uh, to the slowing of the oscillatory activity because of systematic uh, reconfigurations of the state space of, of this population. And again, with this approach, we really understand the complex mechanisms that lead to the observations that we make with empirical methods. So the simulated activity can then be also used to enrich the feature space that we have already provided by the empirical measures. And in this particular study, we were interested in increasing the accuracy of classification of uh, different patient groups or, and healthy subjects. Uh, given the information uh, that we have available. And uh, so the initial data that we received, again, uh, come from the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. It's imaging data, it's PET data, provides a lot of features, but by virtualizing um, the brains of these individuals and simulating the activity, we now also have, on top of all the other empirical features, the simulated local feed potentials, as I have shown you on the previous slides. And we can uh, systematically analyze the different frequency bands, which we have done here, and use this additional information um, for uh, machine learning uh, classification. Here you see just three example uh, features. So this is a simulated alpha band local field potential. This is uh, the um, local amulet beta load, and uh, here you see the tau load, another protein that is often pathologically changed in uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease or neurodegenerative uh, disease, and that can be measured with PET and is also provided in this study for each individual subject. And by enriching now our feature space with this additional uh, simulated information, we sh showed that the accuracy of the uh, classification between healthy controls, patients with mild cognitive impairment and uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease significantly increased. And on top of that, we can now look what are the additional features in our simulated data that improve the classification and one of the most contributing features are the thalamic local field potentials in the alpha frequency range. And uh, we know that the thalamus is um, the driver of the cortical alpha oscillations that um, have been reported to change and, and to slow down in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So there was a study that has been recently published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, Translational Research and Clinical Interventions. We showed that empirical data can be enriched or augmented to improve um, classification in dementia. So now such a model also um, enables us to test uh, virtual interventions. And um, so here in this example, we choose to test uh, a drug that is acting as an antagonist on NMDA, uh, NMDA receptors, uh, a drug called memantine that often is uh, given um, to patients with Alzheimer's disease and often also leads to a temporary improvement of the cognitive state of these patients, unfortunately, only for a limited amount of time. Uh, but here we had our uh, virtual brains of, again, the patients with Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment and healthy controls. And we see here the frequency and the slowing uh, that we have seen also in the previous slides and the simulations of the patients with Alzheimer's disease. And now we add to our model the NMDA antagonistic virtual drug and this acts um, actually at the intersections of the excitatory interneurons and the excitatory pyramidal cells. And when adding this, uh, we see here a normalization of the simulated EG frequencies for the Alzheimer's disease patients. 
So it seems that the slowing that has been observed can be reverted by this virtual drug. And um, in fact, um, the same effect has been shown previously in empirical data already in uh, 2013. Um, giving memantine uh, has led to a decrease of the pathological CETA activity that has been observed in Alzheimer's disease. And the same um, effect can be now simulated um, and uh, uh, we now really understand that the underlying mathematics and the underlying interactions, neuronal interactions that lead to this decrease of CETA activity upon administration of the NMDA antagonist. And in addition to that, we now can again look uh, in the state space. We can see the input that goes to the pyramidal cells and the output um, from the pyramidal cells. Of course, the output depends on the input. Um, and uh, we know that uh, one hypothesis in Alzheimer's disease is that we have excess toxicity because of the disinhibition, because of the lack of the function of the inhibitor interneurons. So the input, the, the, the net of the net excitatory input in the pyramidal cells increases, and this leads also to a, a hyper excitation and increased output of the pyramidal cells. Here on this axis, you see the drug dose, the virtual drug dose, memantine, uh, here it is zero, and then here it increases. And we see that with increasing administration of this virtual memantine, we get a little buffer zone here. Yeah. So this means that if we now increase the excitatory input because of the lack of inhibition to the pyramidal neurons, we still have a little buffer that protects um, the system from hyperexcitation, excitotoxicity, and cell death. And this might be the beneficial effect that we see in these Alzheimer's disease patients. Okay, now I make a, um, a little switch. Um, I want to show you how um, the software is, and also uh, many important additional tools and also data have been made available um, over the past years as part of the Human Brain Project. The Human Brain Project is um, different from the Virtual Brain Project. Um, the, the, I mentioned the Virtual Brain open source software has been released for the first time in 2012. The Human Brain Project uh, was kicked off in 2013. It's a European flagship program that has been funded for 10 years. It's still ongoing until 2023. has been funded with almost um, uh, 1 billion euros. And uh, it has established in the past few years a digital platform called eBrains that uh, shall enable and facilitate collective uh, research um, uh, on the brain. And in March, this digital platform had 5,343 registered users uh, so in order to be able to use all the functionality that is provided by the platform. One has to register. The registration is free and very easy. Um, so you find the platform via URL ebrains.eu and the platform has several uh, services, the data knowledge service that uh, provides a knowledge graph that makes not only data discoverable but also software and tools or models, individual models can be published and uh, made discoverable via for example keyword search so you can look for red brain models, for mouse brain models, for monkey brain models, for human brain models for certain diseases or healthy brain models and so forth. Uh, but you can also search for data sets and uh, for software tools and so forth. And then there's the resource of digital atlases where the special component is that they all refer to common reference spaces. So the different pieces of information can be mapped onto each other and integrated with each other. And of course, this is also very suitable to integrate then this information in brain network models. There are simulation tools and one of the simulation tools provided directly by the platform as the virtual brain. But there are also other uh, simulation frameworks that uh, are being made accessible and that also 
are being developed presently to become interoperable so that the different simulators can interact and the outputs of the simulators can be related and compared. Um, the other uh, technologies, uh, neomorphic uh, systems, um, and also some tools and platforms for um, analyzing uh, or doing research on uh, medical data. Um, this is also statistics from March, just to give you an idea. Now the summer school is very international, which <laughs> I really like, and um, this is the composition of users, was the composition of users of eBrains in March. You see that the largest piece of cake uh, is taken by Germany, so there are many German uh, users, uh, followed by Italy and other European countries. But about a quarter of the users also are from non-European countries, including uh, North America, Asia, South America, Oceania, Oceania and Africa. And what did we do there? So um, we tried to integrate all the different tools related to personalized brain simulation in the existing platform and to make the software that we have developed interoperable with the functionalities of eBrains. Um, so what are the functionalities of eBrains? Um, Causely, I have mentioned it on the previous slide, but more specifically, um, provides uh, the possibility to upload, for example, data in the cloud to, um, to do research on the data using the eBrains platform, but also to share the data, to provide access to the data um, to others, um, or to also isolate the data and, and only keep the data private. We also have the possibility to create um, workspaces, again, to keep them private or to invite collaborators and uh, to provide them access to, to work jointly on data or scripts or, or tools um, within such a protected uh, collaboratory workspace. There are some other tools like um, uh, office um, uh, tools for collaborating on documents like in PowerPoints and uh, Word documents and Excel sheets and so forth. There is also the possibility to run um, Jupyter notebooks, to develop Jupyter notebooks or to, to just import your existing notebooks and run them in the cloud. There's a cloud um, uh, uh, available, and the, the cloud orchestration software. The knowledge graph that I have already mentioned, the graph database that enables um, with the metadata model that is also being developed by eBrains and the Human Brain Project to ingest all kinds of data and tools and make it discoverable via a central um, portal. And then there is the HPC, the High Performance Computing Backend, that is provided by five participating supercomputing centers. Um, now, here you see in blue the virtual brain um, tools and software packages. And uh, for example, here you see the main engine, you see the processing pipelines uh, that I have mentioned before that bring the imaging data in the right formats to then use them to construct personalized brain network models. Or other developments like the multi scale co simulation framework, optimized code for high performance computers or model and version uh, algorithms. And uh, these tools have been made available via different kinds of deployment. So for example, the virtual brain main simulator can be directly accessed via this URL um, on eBrains. And uh, you can just log in eBrains and then uh, directly access the virtual brain there in the cloud. So you do not need to deploy your own instance of the virtual brain on your local computer or somewhere else, but you simply start running the virtual brain um, in the cloud. And the same is true for the um, Python notebooks. So the virtual brain is already pre-deployed and you can run it by Python notebooks on eBrains. Um, it's also available via Docker images so it can be pulled and either run on the HPC backend or on your local computer. 
and so forth. Same is true for the processing pipelines. Um, the communication um, typically is done by RESTful APIs. Um, and uh, this is not only possible with the main core functionalities of eBrands, but also with other software packages like the Neuro Robotics platform or the dig digital atlases, which we connect uh, through um, Zebra Python client. Um, so the, the, this functionality has been developed during the phase two of the Human Brain project it resulted in this publication. Brain simulation as a cloud service the virtual brain on eBrains, where 31 institutions were participating and contributing. And this is a um, sub project of the Human Brain project, was called in the phase two the co design project, um, the virtual brain, because it linked between many different domains. So it was cross cutting and linking together uh, different uh, streams of development. Um, okay, let me just go back because I forgot one very important aspect. We are the EU and the EU has very high standards to protect health data and individualized information, personal information of, of people and uh, subjects and patients. And in order to enable in such a distributed environment provided by uh, distributed supercomputing centers, Personalized brain simulation with sensitive health data, so the personalized brain model, also the imaging data that are being processed to generate such a model are highly personal data and also health data. Uh, so they have, they fall under special uh, protection and are labeled special category of data um, that for which the processing in general is prohibited as of the general data protection regulations and only under certain conditions it is allowed. And we created these conditions by um, providing um, measures to protect the data um, while, they were, um, while they are being processed uh, uh, on eBrains. And the mechanisms, that, um, or the most important mechanisms that have been implemented as access control, encryption, and sandboxing. So the data are um, all the time encrypted, and only the data controller has the decryption key, and that is at any time only the lawful data controller who um, can trigger the decryption of the data, for example, on the high performance compute backend, and when the data are then being decrypted and vulnerable, there's a sandboxing mechanism that protects the data and isolates them so that no um, person can access the data during the processing. And uh, only with these protection measurements, uh, it is lawful to process personalized brain models on a distributed infrastructure such as eBrains. So this has been all described in, in this article, and there you find also a list with all the links to the GitHub repositories, to the pre-deployed software tools, and also the descriptions um, related to the data protection mechanisms that have been implemented. Um, another development that will be detailed uh, during the summer school is the possibility to map systematically biological knowledge from the literature into brain network models to refine the biological plausibility of um, our models. And um, what the tool that has been developed is um, called the Virtual Brain Knowledge Base Adapter. It makes use of another a tool that has been developed or set of tools by Fraunhofer, the Fraunhofer Institute Sky. Um, and uh, this pre-existing tool has um, annotated automatically a large amount of scientific articles, so more than uh, 35 million publications indexed and PubMed have been analyzed and annotated with a certain standard ontologies. And a large database has been created that uh, stores all this information. And we have now linked this pre-existing database that is um, updated constantly because new publications 
are being added and um, being classified, annotated, and added to the database. The TVB knowledge based adapter can directly draw this information from the database and links it uh, with the spatial annotation for each concept or entity. And uh, this additional step um, linking the pathways, you know, the signaling cascades uh, that have been published uh, in millions of, of, of papers to the actual location in the body, or in this case in, in the brain, enables us to integrate this information systematically uh, into our brain uh, models. So um, what you see here is such a knowledge graph. And what you see here is just a glimpse in the virtual brain ontology that also annotates all the state variables and parameters that are being used in the framework of the virtual brain. And uh, with this um, additional annotation of uh, the, the brain network model um, world, or all the entities in the, in the world of brain network modeling, it is possible to find the intersections between the biological knowledge graphs and the brain models and use this intersection points to integrate this uh, existing information in our brain network models. Um, I think uh, Leon Stefanowski and Konstantin Bülow and also Leon Martin will dedicate some time to show you in more detail how this is feasible. And I think also Julie Cotiol will talk about this topic in one of the next sessions. Um, this is just an illustration that shows you the possibility to use also the virtual brain knowledge adapter to interface with uh, the Zebra Python client that has been developed by Jülich in, in, uh, in the framework of the Human Brains project and that allows to, uh, for example, draw information about receptor distributions in the brain, so there are spatial maps that uh, quantify the receptor um, uh, distributions that can be then integrated like layers of an onion on top of, of our standard brain models and uh, um, inform the parametrization of uh, the local population models. And we can then systematically see how such a change of the parametrization by integrating, for example, um, a certain distribution of receptors, for example, serotonergic receptors, how that changes the local and the global dynamics in the brain, for example, leads to a slowing of the prominent uh, EG oscillations, or also an increase of, of, of the frequency or local change. Um, so this is the virtual brain knowledge-based adapter. Many other nice things can be done. And of course, also with the visualization tools that we have developed as part of, of these projects. So here you see a, a tool that has been developed um, in the Human Brain project by our team that initially had the purpose to be used in a traveling exhibition by the Human Brain project that was kicked off in the Bloomfield Museum in Jerusalem, I think two years ago. And there, I think it is still presented on a large um, touch screen um, where um, the, the visitors of the exhibition can directly interact with the brain. They can select the different brain regions or they can just choose them here in the list. And then they get uh, some information about the related functional networks. And this is available, I think this is not visible, here now in, I think, about eight different languages, including Arabic and Hebrew and English. And I think the latest edition was Spanish also, Polish and so forth. Um, this is now also made available via this URL. Um, and it is being further developed. So here you see just another language version of it. Um, these um, visualization tools have been also used for mobile apps that our lab is developing and for games that uh, can that work in combination with wireless new headsets. Um, you see one example, there are different headsets available. 
And on the one hand, it allows to visualize um, with more or less good quality your own activity on your mobile device, your brain activity. It also enables you to control, for example, such little new feedback games, that control the, the little cat and make it, for example, fly to go over, over uh, mountains um, or yeah, to go down again to avoid any obstacles. Um, this technology also has been used for larger art science exhibitions. And so we have uh, used it to link together up to 20 um, uh, visitors' uh, brain activities and jointly with the help of such new headsets, they are able to control via synchronization and desynchronization certain um, multimedia uh, uh, contents. So this, uh, this art science uh, exhibition is called My Virtual Dream and has been performed um, in the past uh, during almost every long night of sciences uh, that we had for the past seven years. This year will be the first time that we are not having this exhibition. <laughs> we somehow missed the registration uh, deadline for that. But uh, there are videos online, I think, and it's quite impressive. Um, but another nice recent development or, that also benefits from the virtual brain, virtual brain knowledge base adapter is um, a museum exhibition where the organizers have approached us. They wanted to um, make accessible um, the topic of Freiheit in German, and so argument. The Technical Museum in Berlin, and the, the exhibition after one year will travel to the Technical Museum in Frankfurt. And uh, we used now the virtual brain knowledge base adapter to extract from the more than 35 million publications those functional networks um, uh, that have been, for which evidence in the literature exists, that they are associated with certain concepts that can be related to the topic argument. So, for example, controversy, debate, despair, um, envy, uh, frustration, grief, guilt. And uh, this uh, yeah, will be then also an interactive uh, touch screen that is being made available to the audience so they can directly learn about the different functional networks. And, uh, this is just another example where we um, do public outreach work. So this is a Humboldt forum where the visualizations of the virtual brain are part of the um, big uh, tower in, in, in the light, uh, in the big um, uh, light room of, uh, of the museum. There's also the Humboldt lab in one of the, the rooms uh, that are surrounding this big area where the users can interactively uh, learn about virtual brain uh, simulations. They can uh, build uh, uh, their own virtual brain and they learn about the outputs of the simulator, the different frequency bands in the simulated EG and so forth. So they don't know about the ingredients to construct a personalized brain network model. And we are very happy that as a side product, the virtual brain also uh, can be used for, for such um, yeah, communication activities to the broad public. Now I switch back more to the science topic. I mentioned um, in the beginning the development of the co-simulation framework that allows to co-simulate brain regions at different degrees of detail. And uh, here you see just an example. Um, we have uh, a network of mean field um, neural mass models, and then some of the regions are defined as at a, a greater degree of detail with spiking neural networks. So each of the little balls represents uh, inhibitory or excitatory spiking neuron. Um, the technology um, uh, has been published in this. Uh, Brain Simulation as a Service, a cloud service, the Virtual Brain on eBrains uh, publication. You can read the details there. And the first uh, application for use case has also been recently published in Experimental Neurology. 
Um, the title of the publication is virtual deep brain stimulation, multi-scale co-simulation of spiking basal ganglia model and whole brain mean field model with the virtual brain. And here um, we benefit actually from this possibility to simulate the brain at different scales to understand the impact of deep brain stimulation. So here you have seen the, the, the electrode, here you see it a little bit more clearer, you see the structures of the basal ganglia and the virtual electrode that is inserted um, in the uh, nucleus subthalamicus. And uh, in the study that also will be presented by Jill Meyer in one of the next sessions, um, and Dennis Pedicus or Dionysius Pedicus will give you more insights about the co-simulation framework, the technology behind. It is now possible to precisely stimulate different um, compartments of the basal ganglia and to monitor the detailed effect on the spiking, so um, not only the spike rate, but also the spike timing of neurons in these deep brain structures, including the thalamus. And at the same time, we get uh, also the activity, the mean field activity, and then the translated activity of the fMRI, EG, and MEG in uh, all the other uh, cortical regions of the brain. And this is just the first glimpse. You get more details than in the presentation by Jill Meyer. But uh, this is uh, the unique aspect that now you get really spike trains with spike timing in the different structures of the basal ganglia and the thalamus, as you can see here. And on the other hand, you get the cortical activations. And what you see here is the thalamus activity during off stimulations. We don't have deep brain stimulation here. And here you see the increase of the firing rate and the thalamus for three different types of deep brain stimulation. Two different structures are being stimulated in silico virtually. The globus pallidus internus, the subthalamic nucleus. And here for the subthalamic nucleus, we can now have different stimulus patterns, both biphasic and monophasic in this example. And you will see then in the presentation by Jill that while here the thalamic effect is a normalization of the, um, of the firing rate, which is nice. Um, so the, the decrease, pathological decrease of the firing rate is counteractive through this in silico deep brain stimulation, but the effects on, at the cortical scale are quite heterogeneous. And uh, this is additional relevant information to um, optimize the outcome of the stimulation for the individual patient. Um, a very recent development is also the coupling of the virtual brain with the robotics, neuro robotics simulation platform. Um, here you see uh, the implementation of a very popular um, experiment, the Haken Kelso Bunz model, yeah, that shows that um, in a certain task where the participant has to move. The fingers, um, uh, uh, as you can see here, in uh, phase, and you, if the frequency of this movement is increased from a certain frequency on, um, the um, fingers will move in antiphase. And this is a principle that you can observe in yourself if you just try it now. But that also is a result of the complex dynamics um, underlying uh, this behavior. This has been this model has been published before. We now implemented it in the virtual brain and just connected it with the um, with, a, with, a, with a, the simulated uh, robotic fingers, which gives a nice uh, illustration of the actual output of of uh, the brain model. So now I come to, to the last part of my presentation. And uh, I think the, yeah, maybe one of the really most exciting parts where we now link uh, the dynamics, not just to uh, robotic hands, but really um, to cognitive performance and behavior. And this is a preliminary work. We're just preparing the publication. But uh, I, I do not want to, um, to, to hide this from you because I think that could be a nice inspiration 
for your future work and um, so I show you the unpublished results here. Uh, Misha Schoenert will talk in the next session and I think he will probably also speak a lot about the potential of using the virtual brain to really understand the principles and mechanisms not only underlying uh, brain dynamics but uh, really underlying the brain function. He's also the or will be the first author of this uh, uh, publication in preparation. Um, so um, in this study, we investigated the, um, the big uh, concept of intelligence. And uh, if you have uh, dealt with this, uh, you probably know that there are many different components that contribute to what is known under the label general intelligence. Um, one of those components is the ability for deep um, thinking and problem solving. And for each of the different uh, components that, that make up the general intelligence, we also have uh, certain cognitive tests and one uh, frequently used test to probe the ability for deep uh, thinking and problem solving is a patent progressive matrices test, PMAT. This is just one example. Um, the, the test has increasing difficulties. And, um, I think this is one of the, the easy um, tasks here. Um, so the subject uh, has, or participant, has to complement the series of patterns identifying the underlying hidden rule. And um, uh, unfortunately, it's now for me difficult to interact with you. So uh, I would love to ask you, or does anybody know what would be the answer um, for for this task? So, what which one of the eight panels that you see at the bottom would be the right one to to be placed in the lower right corner of this panel? Who knows the answer? Just speak up because I cannot see you and just unmute if you know it, and um, I will tell you whether it's right or not right. The last one. Wonderful, that's correct. Can you explain your decision? Um, yeah, so basically the gray parts are wandering apart from each other. And in this case, when they do the next step, they would be in the position of the last picture. Yeah, so that's correct. Thank you very much. Um, and this is the nature of the test that is being used. Uh, so you have to keep some information in working memory and the more difficult the task is, the more information and intermediate results you have to keep in your working memory to then come to your final decision. Um, another type of intelligence is cognitive flexibility. And this usually relates to very easy to solve problems. And it is tested, for example, with a dimensional change card sorting test. Um, and there, the participant has to switch between um, mapping between different or selecting between different domains. So here, in the first example, the task would be to map um, or to sort according to the color. And the participant would uh, sort the gray uh, ship uh, towards the gray uh, rabbit. Uh, then in the next task, uh, the, the um, participant would have to change the strategy and sort according to the shape. So the rabbit belongs to the rabbit and the ship belongs to the ship. And uh, the switching is ongoing and there the reaction time would be measured as a measure of the performance. Um, so now, um, probably um, many people think that uh, the reaction time, so being fast, is a measure of um, general intelligence. And uh, we analyze this, and um, I should say, Misha Stoner analyzed this um, and uh, used for this uh, the data of the Human Connectome Project. This is a very nice data set. It provides imaging data, but also a large uh, variety of cognitive test scores in addition to the imaging data for each individual subject. So this is a cohort of um, young adults. And um, as part of, of this data set, um, 
the G factor, the general intelligence uh, score, and also the score in this uh, PIMA test, the, the test for deep uh, thinking or for fluid intelligence um, has been published. So now what you see here on the x-axis is um, the, the other 24 increasingly difficult tasks of the fluid intelligence test. And in uh, dark blue and light blue, you see the correlation between the reaction time of the individuals. Uh, so the, I think it was, uh, for, for this uh, statistical test, it was about 1,000 individuals. Later on for modeling this, we could use 650 individuals for which we had the complete imaging data also available. Um, and uh, what we see is that for the easy, uh, easily to solve problems uh, until the eighth task of the fluid intelligence test, Indeed, those who had a larger score in general intelligence on fluid intelligence, the reaction times were shorter, so there was a, a negative correlation. But then when the task became more difficult, um, the reaction time uh, correlated positively with the general intelligence score and the fluid intelligence score, which means that the more the better scoring or the higher scoring um, individuals took more time to provide the answer in this fluid intelligence test. Um, and that's very interesting. Um, so they took, uh, it took longer to answer for them, but their performance was um, also better, which led to the increased score in the fluid intelligence test and the general intelligence test. So the, the insight here is that uh, faster is not always better, uh, but sometimes uh, slower leads, uh, slower reactions lead to, to uh, better performance. Um, so what you see here is uh, the correlation between the functional connectivity of these individuals with the general factor of intelligence and the fluid intelligence. And uh, we see that there's very low correlation. So I think it was not significant. Interestingly, if we look at the, the correlation between the functional connectivity and the reaction times and the fluid intelligence tasks on the task that requires deep thinking, we find a positive um, correlation and it's highly significant. So the higher the functional connectivity, so the, the stronger the correlations in the brain network, the higher the synchrony uh, was in this a cohort of the human connectome project, um, the longer was also the reaction time of the individuals. And now um, we thought that uh, we could use the approach of brain network modeling to reconstruct uh, the brain uh, models for the 650 individual subjects for which the data were complete and to um, simulate the functional connectivity and analyze what mechanisms would lead to the longer reaction times that um, have been related to the higher degree of synchronization and the functional connectivity, so higher correlations of the network, um, and also to the higher, um, to the better performance in the decision-making task. Um, to this end, we constructed these brain network models um, uh, as done typically with uh, using the, the structural connectome derived from diffusion tensor imaging data, tractography. Um, I think we had about 360 brain regions of the Glasser parcellation. And each uh, region is represented by neural mass models, excitatory mass, inhibitory mass that are mutually interacting. There's a, a long distance excitatory um, uh, interaction between all the excite, excitatory uh, masses. And as a new development compared to previous studies um, with the virtual brain, we also introduced an effect, uh, a long distance effect of the excitatory populations on the inhibitory neural masses. So we have a feed forward inhibition. The excitatory populations feed towards inhibitory populations. 
and lead uh, to an increased inhibitory activity of long-range excitation and uh, long-range feedforward inhibition. And with this additional mechanism, it was possible to really, in a very fine-grained manner, reproduce the functional chronic tones of these 650 individuals. And uh, the tuning algorithm that was uh, um, uh, invented uh, by Michel is illustrated here. So basically what is used to, to, um, to tune, to optimize the functional connectivity matrix for each individual um, is the excitation inhibition balance yeah, that controls the functional connectivity. And um, this is shown here. So now if we change, you see this, uh, there is a sickness, the changing sickness of the arrows, the degree of excitation versus the degree of feed forward inhibition. Um, you see how this changes the degree of synchronization in the network and the functional connectivity. Yeah, so um, here you see the uh, sliding effect. And this is how we now can tune the functional connectivity, the simulated functional connectivity. This is an example of empirical, and here step by step, by increasing the long range excitation inhibition ratio, the simulated um, functional connectivity becomes a very close, um, uh, a very close approximation of the empirical functional connectivity. So with this uh, um, construction of, of such an optimized model, we now can also analyze the uh, input currents that drive the populations. And uh, we can look at the average amplitude that goes in the different brain regions and the degree of correlation um, in the input currents that drive all the different regions of the brain. And interestingly, this is what, what has been done here. So we see the input correlations and the input amplitude um, as a function of the reaction time. Well, actually, I think this is not, yeah, this is the reaction time. And we see um, that uh, the higher the input currents, uh, the longer is the reaction time and the, um, well, actually, that was wrong. So, so that the higher the correlation of the input currents, the longer is the reaction time. And uh, the lower the input amplitude, the longer is the reaction time. So reaction time um, correlates, reaction time from the real individuals correlates negatively with the simulated input amplitude that drives the, all the brain regions of our brain network models. And it correlates positively with the degree of correlation of the input currents in all the brain regions of the model. And this is already quite interesting because now here for the first time we relate the um, simulated features, degree of uh, correlation of input currents and amplitude of input currents that have been derived from the model that are not directly accessible with empirical data to an empirical uh, metric, the reaction time. We find a very strong correlation. Um, also, a, correlation, a strong correlation has been found between the input amplitude and the correlation and the functional connectivity. And uh, this is illustrated here in this nice animation that when the excitation inhibition balance is tuned, we not only can tune the functional connectivity, but at the same time, systematically, the degree of input correlation in all brain regions and the input amplitude is being modulated. Um, so now we have a model that is able to um, simulate the, this, this very uh, high precision. The, a functional connectivity matrix of each individual. And the question is now, how does that relate, how can that explain the differential behavior of uh, these uh, individuals? So in order to explore this further, we have now placed a functional um, circuit that has been shown before to be able to mimic uh, decision-making and um, working memory. What we have here are uh, four neural masses. Uh, two are located in the prefrontal cortex, two are located in the posterior parietal cortex. They are mutually in, uh, inhibiting. 
and uh, they are um, being uh, stimulated uh, by um, input currents and uh, this can be compared to this uh, random dot motion experiment where the dots move um, uh, dominant, uh, dominantly uh, uh, in one of the two directions. But because of the high noise level and depending on the contrast, the dominant direction is very difficult uh, to recognize. And uh, this is very similar to how we stimulate here these uh, competing neuronal populations, population B and A are mutually competing. They both get input, noisy input currents, but one of the two populations get, get slightly more stimulated, yeah? it is receiving slightly more evidence. Um, so these are these populations um, are um, uh, building so-called attractor states, which uh, later explains that in more detail. And uh, depending on which of the two competing uh, population models or neural masses um, succeed uh, to reach the high energy attractor state first, will be the winner. So it's um, a winner take it all competition. And at that moment, when one of the two competing populations reaches such an attractor state, the decision has been made. Um, so now, if we analyze such a circuit model, um, we can see that the input amplitude and the degree of correlation that has been shown to correlate uh, to the functional connectivity and also to the reaction times of the real individuals behind the brain models, they also determine and influence the decision performance of this, these circuit models. Um, the, the percentage of correct decisions are color coded here, and the integration time, reaction time is color coded here. Um, here in the upper panels, you see the uh, input uh, amplitude and the parietal cortex, um, and uh, the input amplitude in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, same here, but here we look at the integration time. And in the lower panel, uh, we systematically explore the degree of input correlations in the uh, parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And we see, without looking into more detail here now, that depending on the degree of correlation of the activities that drive these regions and also the amplitude, um, the performance, uh, the, the percentage of correct decisions, and also the reaction time do differ. Um, as mentioned before, these uh, neural mass models are also capable of uh, simulating or mimicking a working memory um, performance, also by reaching a high energy attractor state. And here, these three diagrams show three different scenarios for three different input currents again. Um, uh, low, intermediate, and high. And uh, the colors indicate, um, the gray regions indicate um, areas where a certain input uh, stimulus would not be capable to elevate um, the state towards a high energy attractor. And this means that no working memory trace could be generated. Yeah, so this is indicated by the gray regions. The red regions indicate zones where we have um, we can trigger a 100% robust uh, memory trace. That means if there is a distracting stimulus, then the attractor still um, is maintained, so the state is kept in the high energy attractor state. And the blue zones indicate areas where um, a distracting stimulus would um, be capable to um, move the state out of this attractor state and to disturb or destroy the working memory trace. Um, and the axes indicate uh, the input current and the recurrent structure of the model. So what we see is that the zones differ between the three scenarios of the different input amplitudes. We see that for very low input amplitudes, it takes quite a lot to um, elicit a working memory trace. So there are many gray areas, which means in these zones, it's not possible to, to trigger 
uh, uh, working memory trays. So it takes a pretty high um, stimulus or high degree of evidence to um, elevate the system towards that attractor state. On the other hand, uh, we see that um, if that has been achieved in the low amplitude scenario, then we have a large red area where the working memory trace is kept uh, uh, stable. Um, if we move to this panel, where we have a high um, amplitude, uh, input current amplitude, we see that it is possible with very small stimuli already to trigger a working memory trace. And therefore, also noisy stimuli would be capable to trigger uh, a trace. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we see that the blue area is larger than the other scenarios, which means that the working memory trace is not stable, can be easily destroyed by a distracting stimulus. So in this scenario, um, you can easily switch between different states because it takes um, uh, only a very little stimulus to to destroy the pre-existing state. And this is just another visualization of the same, um, you know, the same idea. Uh, here we have, again, in the three colors, the three different degrees of input amplitudes. Blue is high, green is low. And we see that for the green uh, low input amplitude, it takes um, a higher threshold to um, overwrite the pre-existing working memory trace. And um, also here you see that for the green low amplitude uh, scenario, it takes also a higher threshold, a higher stimulus um, in order to trigger to establish a working memory trace to, to, to push the state into a high attractor um, uh, regime. So um, now here we look um, at the simulated and the empirical performance. Um, so the simulated performance simulated by our 650 individual brain network models and the actual uh, empirical performance measured in the individuals behind uh, these virtual brains. And what you see here is a simulated decision-making performance. So now our little circuit model that sits in the prefrontal cortex and posterior cortex is taking the decisions, um, and this is related to the decisions um, by the individuals, and we see a very high correlation. And we see the same uh, degree of high uh, correlation for the reaction time. So um, the higher um, the performance, or the better the performance on the fluid intelligence test, um, the longer was the reaction time in our simulations. So here you see, um, you just get an idea on the actual signal traces. Uh, so here in the, in, with the different colors, um, we see the areas, um, uh, the competing areas A and B. Blue is A, green is population B. Um, and the Posterior parietal cortex and, and the prefrontal cortex. And again, we have five scenarios, five different input amplitudes, and we see the signal um, actually exemplary. So these are just examples of, of individual trajectories of these four popul uh, populations. And here we see that the blue population reaches first the high attractor state, the high energy state. And this means that in this example scenario, the blue population A, that actually represents the actual uh, correct solution, was the winner. So that would have been a correct solution in this case. And the same as, uh, as the case in this example. And in this example, here in the high amplitude examples, we have uh, uh, scenarios where the green populations B um, are the winner, um, despite of the fact that in general the A population is getting higher evidence. Um, there are situations when nevertheless the B population wins because of the high level of noise and the low contrast. Um, and now we look at the phase space plots and they can tell us more about the why. So why, why do our 
artificial brain network models that have been constructed based on the individual uh, MRI data of, of, of the data subjects, why are they performing differently? And why is this different performance related to the performance of the actual subjects? Um, so what you see here, are again, five scenarios, five different amplitudes, input amplitudes, as we had on the previous slide, um, lowest amplitude, highest amplitude. And what you see here now for the three rows, um, three different time points. Now, if we go back, we see here the little arrows and they indicate three different time points um, dur during uh, 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 the trajectory is behaving, um, is uh, evolving through the state space. So here in the beginning, the evidence is accumulated and here at a certain point, then one of the populations, the winner population is ramping up and reaching the attractor space. And we have three time points of interest, the baseline um, uh, uh, time point, then the time point when the ramping up of one of the population starts and then the time point when the high attractor um, state has been reached by one of the populations. So this represents the three um, rows here. And the color indicates um, the uh, flow field. Um, you also see the null clients of the two populations. So the axis show the activity, as you can see here, of population e, uh, A and population B. Um, the green and the blue um, lines are the null clients for the two populations. The uh, brown line is a, a separatrix. Um, and the trajectories on top, the red and the green trajectories that you see here and here and here, these are 1,000 simulations and they're colored according to the decisions. Um, uh, with which they end up. Yeah? So if, if the decision goes towards population A, if population A is the winner, the trajectories are colored green. If population B is the winner, then it's colored red. Um, and what you see here in the middle, so this is intermediate input amplitude, um, is that uh, the state space looks pretty uh, symmetric. Yeah? So we have here the, uh, the separatrix, we have here the attractor states, um, so that, that would be the basins of attractions into which the trajectory is uh, pulled. And either if it goes to population A, it would be a correct uh, decision, or if it goes to population B, it would be a wrong decision. Um, so now if we look here in this example, this would be at the beginning when the evidence integration starts. So here the trajectories of population A and B the activity of population A and B are still on the diagonal, so it's balanced. Yeah. So that means that uh, none of the two is the winner, they both have about the same level of activity. And we see here on the separatrix the so-called saddle point, and uh, these are the uh, two um, stable attractors. Uh, and one of those would be reached by the uh, trajectory than the decision would have been made. Um, we also see that because of the saddle point, the um, flow field are um, uh, pulled along the diagonal. But here on the second panel, we see already that upon the input of the feedback input of the prefrontal cortex, the saddle point moves a little bit more in this direction. And the um, basin of attraction in the upper um, left uh, area is getting smaller, the basin of attraction of the lower right area is getting higher, and the trajectory is pulled towards the correct decision in this case, um, the, the, the lower right attractor. Um, if we then now move in this scenario with higher uh, input amplitude, um, or with lower, sorry, with lower input amplitude, we see that the state space configuration has changed. So here we had the saddle point here, now the saddle point is here. And this also changes the configuration of the flow fields and keeps the flow fields even stronger at the diagonal. Yeah, so it's more difficult for the trajectories to escape since here's another attractor 
from the diagonal towards the other two stable attractors. And then we see that then after some time of evidence integration, the prefrontal cortex um, feeds back. And uh, we see that um, the settle point is moving slightly. And again, one basin of attraction is getting larger, and one is smaller, the decision is being made. And again, the attractor on the right lower corner is the winner. This is even more obvious here. Um, it was not so clear probably here. It's now becoming very evident when we have even um, smaller input amplitudes. We see again a reconfiguration of the state space. Now we have even two saddles here. We have another stable attractor here in the middle that keeps again the two populations even more to the diagonals, which gives it more time to integrate evidence and average out noise. And then the prefrontal cortex feeds back, and we see how then only the uh, two um, saddle points, uh, saddle, uh, uh, points merge into one, and the additional um, stable attractor is dissolving. And again, then after um, quite a long integration time because of uh, the strong attractors see in the diagonal a decision is being made and the system moves uh, to the stable attractor in the right lower corner. And if we go to the other side, we see that um, here the contrary happens. So now here we have another stable attractor in the upper um, uh, right corner and two um, saddle uh, nodes uh, on the left and on the right of the stable uh, attractor. And uh, this um, accelerates the, the flow field and pushes uh, the system very early on towards the decision. So there's not much, oops, sorry, there's not much time for integration, but uh, uh, very quickly, um, after a very short time of evidence uh, integration, the flow fields uh, escape uh, to either of the two um, uh, attractors. And since there's very little time for evidence integration, it means that the noise can become more influential and can um, very early on push already the trajectory to one of the two stable attractors, which can be also the wrong attractor, which leads to a higher quote of, of uh, wrong decisions in this scenario with, with higher amplitudes. And this is dynamically shown here. So what we change here is the input amplitude. And the, the changing the input amplitude changes the configuration of the state space. And this changes um, the percentage of correct decisions and also the um, integration time. So if we move down in input amplitude, correct decisions get higher, integration time longer. If we go up, then it's the other way around. And this is now one input amplitude, yeah, so this is kept uh, fixed now. Uh, we see the trajectories uh, for correct decisions and incorrect decisions. And um, here we see the, the percentage of correct decisions and the related uh, integration time. Okay, so now this was all related to the amplitude, but also the degree of correlation um, uh, plays a role. And this is nicely visualized here. Um, so what you see here is that the, the gradient flow fields um, are no, um, no lines anymore, but they get a distribution. So this is very similar to the glyphs that we find in diffusion tensor tracking, where we also have a distribution because it's a stochastic method and uh, exactly as in diffusion tensor tracking, the, uh, the shape of the glyphs indicate the degree of certainty. So if the glyphs are more round, it means that the direction is, um, or the, the amount, um, the magnitude um, in each direction is equal, while if the glyphs are getting more stretched, this indicates that one direction is uh, being dominated. Um, again, we have five scenarios, five different degrees of input correlations, and we see that the peakiness or roundness um, of these uh, glyphs increases with higher degrees of correlations. 
And uh, now we can compute uh, from uh, this data the average um, speed of the flow fields, independence of the noise correlations, and we find this U-shaped uh, form, which indicates that depending on the noise correlation, the flow field um, uh, speed uh, is changing. So with um, high correlation and with low correlation, noise correlation, we have uh, very high speeds that give only very, uh, very few time for integrating evidence and with intermediate degree of correlation. We have um, slower speeds which give more time uh, to the system to integrate evidence and to emerge out um, noise and to come to better decisions. And this is also dynamically shown here. So here we see the change of the input correlation. We see how this changes the configuration of these little glyphs, the flow fields, the rustic flow fields. And we see how this changes the degree of correct decisions and also the integration time. And with this, I end this part of uh, cognitive um, uh, research. Um, so using the virtual brain to understand cognitive perform performance of uh, human subjects. And I think I would like to check the time. I think it's time to summarize. So basically what the virtual brain provides is the possibility um, for individualized uh, clinical and translational research. There are three main pillars. Um, number one, uh, I think I've shown this extensively, in my overview presentation is the identification of mechanisms. Um, and this is not only helpful for understanding how the brain works, but also understanding pathological mechanisms and using this understanding to invent, to come up with new preventive strategies or therapeutic strategies. Then the second pillar is augmenting classification and diagnostics using the virtual brain as uh, computational microscope uh, revealing hidden state variables that can then enrich the feature space and lead to more precise diagnostics and prediction. And the third pillar is the in silico planning of therapeutic interventions that could be uh, virtual drug therapies or uh, deep brain stimulation or other types of interventions that can be tested with the help of the virtual brain. And at the end, I would like to acknowledge the lab members who all contributed to the work that I have shown to you. Um, this is our lab in Berlin, the brain simulation section, you know, about 40 people, but uh, even more people contributed. So here you see the large collaborative uh, projects, eBrain, Human Brain Project, Virtual Brain Cloud, and the Virtual Brain. And there are many PIs are collaborating and um, yeah, we are doing the work together. And here this uh, little cloud indicates the latest project that is ongoing where we develop, I didn't have time to talk about this today, uh, GDPR compliant uh, cloud solutions for enabling such complex personalized simulations in distributed infrastructure. So the project is called the Health Data Cloud and there's a follow up project eBrain Health that has this development and the focus. So now I would be really happy to take questions. I stopped my screen sharing, um, but if, we, if you want me to um, switch back to a, a slide for your questions, I will turn it on again. But just to see you better, um, I will turn it off now. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm curious about your questions and your comments. I turn off the recording as I promised. <laughs>